A mayor in northern Japan is sharply criticizing the approval of construction on a nuclear plant near his city. Toshiki Kudo says the Tokyo-based operator and the central government have ignored safety concerns by people in his city. He's filed a lawsuit to stop construction on the facility. NHK World's Karan Otago reports. Toshiki Kudo is raising concerns over who would take responsibility for local people if an accident at the plant ever occurred. Is it the central government? The answer to this fundamental question is still very vague, while construction of the plants goes ahead. And the challenge of evacuation of residents is entirely left to local government, and no information is given to us. They do not learn any lessons from the Fukushima Daiichi accident. In the lawsuit, Kudo is demanding a halt to ongoing construction of the Oma nuclear power plant, 23 kilometers away from his city. If completed, it will be the world's first commercial nuclear power plant using plutonium as its only fuel. The operator, J-Power, is preparing to apply for a safety inspection required under new government guidelines this fall. The mayor argues that the safety of the plant cannot be secured under the guidelines. He says the damage from an accident at the Oma nuclear plant would be so great his city would no longer be able to function. Kudo has repeatedly expressed his opinions, but he has been largely ignored because his city isn't hosting the plant. So the mayor filed the lawsuit earlier this month at the Tokyo District Court against the central government and the company. Whether it is about constructing a new facility or restarting the existing one, we must provide an appropriate explanation to people and gain understanding. Pushing through a plan that's already decided on is not acceptable in a democracy. After the disaster at Fukushima Daiichi, local governments within a 30-kilometer radius of any nuclear plant in Japan are required to make plans to evacuate residents in case of a nuclear accident. The city is among them. But municipalities such as Hakodate have no say in the operation of the plants, even though they could directly impact the community. Experts point out other mayors might follow Kudo in the future and demand their voice be heard when plants across country start to come back online. Government leaders in central Japan are voicing their own concerns about a new safety system designed to deal with nuclear emergencies. Tokyo Electric Power Company tested a new filtered venting system at its Kashiwazaki Kariwa plant in Niigata Prefecture. They're installing the system in a bid to ease public concerns before a plan to restart reactors. The system is designed to reduce pressure in the reactor containment vessel during emergencies while limiting emissions of radioactive materials. The venting system is a requirement under tougher safety guidelines that took effect last July. Workers funneled nitrogen through a cylinder to determine whether the gas flowed through the piping as planned during a test. The gas was used in place of radioactive fumes. Officials in Niigata say radioactive materials released through the filter may affect residents. Experts are now reviewing the system's safety and methods of operation. Just as in the fable, he will grant us three wishes. The decision is ours. What should we wish for? What do we need most? Our coal and oil will not last forever. Yet we need ever more power. So, for the growth of our civilization, our first wish shall be for power. Here with my right hand I give you the magic fire of the atom. It is yours. The atomic fire is an almost endless source of heat. We can use it in power stations for producing electricity. Electric power of our modern civilization. And then, 
the atom will run our ships. And of course, the atomic submarine already exists. The atomic fire can heat air as well as water. Then the atom becomes the driving force of a jet engine. It can drive an airplane. An airplane that circles the world many times without ever landing for fuel. And eventually the atom will help us to cast off the shackles of gravity and fly through the vast reaches of outer space. Here we are, burning up our coal and oil only to produce power. But now we have a new source of power. Clean, silent, plentiful. Coal and oil can now be saved for better things. We can use them for making plastics, dyes, textiles and drugs. Mankind has ever suffered from hunger and disease. So our second wish shall be for food and health. With this hand I give you a source of beneficial rays. They are magic tools for research that will help you to create food and to cure diseases. Magic tools, indeed they are, these radioactive rays. For example, an ordinary needle can be made radioactive. And then, if it is hidden in the proverbial haystack, it can easily be found by the rays it gives off. Like this needle, all radioactive materials can be traced by their telltale rays. With radioactive chemicals, we can now literally watch how plants grow and we can trace plant nourishments from soil to fruit. In this way, science will help to produce bigger and richer crops. The growth of animals can be studied in the same way and the best food can be found for better and healthier livestock. So the atom creates more food for our ever-growing population. It is a profound responsibility to be entrusted with the leadership of Fukushima Daiichi D&D Engineering Company. Our sole focus, my sole focus, is to do everything possible as safely and as steady as possible to decontaminate and decommission the Fukushima Daiichi site and to help revitalizing uh, the surrounding region. My first priority as Chief Decommissioning Officer is to overcome the challenge regarding management of contaminated water. The need to clean it, the need to store it safely, and the need to keep it from flowing to the sea. Toward this end, we are building impermeable walls on both land side and sea side of the facility. We are continuing to build and improve storage facilities, and perhaps most importantly, we have put into operation an advanced liquid purification system, the ARPUS system, that removes most sources of radioactivity from the water. By utilizing this system, we intend to achieve the ambitious goal of cleaning all the stored water by the end of this fiscal year. The utility is hoping to process all the contaminated water in storage tanks by the end of March 2015, but has no prospective date for when ALPS will be back in full operation. Currently, only one of the three lines has been operating. Another important phase of our work that is also underway is the removal of spent fuel from the reactor building. We began this process with the removal of spent fuel from Unit 4 last autumn. That 
This process has gone smoothly and safely and will be completed by the end of this year. The next year, uh, we will start removing spent fuel from Unit 3. Right out loud, what are you supposed to do when you see the flash? <laughs> Our long-term goal is the safe removal of nuclear debris from the three destroyed reactors. It will take years and is technologically demanding. But we are committed to accomplishing it, and the planning and the research is already underway. In all of this work, our industri industrial partners will play an important role, and we continue to benefit from and deeply appreciate the support of gu and guidance we have been receiving from our partners around the world. I intend to improve working condition for everyone so that we can work as a team. We are setting clear and high expectations for ourselves, our workers, and our partners. In Japan, quite often when a certain construction project requires an immediate workforce, in large numbers, bosses make a phone call to the Yakutsa. So was the case with Fukushima. The government called TEPCO to take urgent action. TEPCO relayed it to subcontractors, and they, eventually, as they had a shortage of available workers, called the Yakutsa for help. We are instilling a more stringent safety culture throughout the company. We will strengthen our project management through training and the addition of skilled staff, and we are addressing problems that have been identified in contract management and supervision. Carry on with the execution. <laughs> Progress may be uneven. Setbacks and the unexpected challenges are inevitable. But for however long our project lasts, we are committed to seeing it through and to using the knowledge we gain for the benefit of the entire nuclear industry and for all in Japan and everywhere who depend on our nuclear power. Officials from Japan are considering whether to allow an annual research whaling drive in the northwestern Pacific Ocean. Judges with the International Court of Justice in The Hague ruled last month against Japan's whaling program in the Antarctic. They said it was not being carried out for scientific purposes, but the ruling does not apply to other areas. The Japanese carry out another hunt in the northwestern Pacific. It's scheduled to start in two weeks off the city of Ishinomaki, northeastern in Japan, and there are plans to extend it next month farther out into the ocean. Japanese officials will decide as early as next week if the expedition will go ahead. How's it going, everyone? I'm Abby Martin, and this is Breaking the Set. So the U.S. Navy just announced an incredible new technological breakthrough that military officials are calling a game changer. And no, I'm not talking about sharks with laser beams attached to their heads. Instead, Navy researchers have figured out how to convert seawater into fuel. Yes, Navy scientists have achieved this goal by extracting hydrogen gas and carbon dioxide from seawater and using a catalytic converter to change them into liquids that could potentially power ships and planes. Amazing. Now, it should be noted that the specific process does not result in a carbon-neutral fuel yet. Another process using seawater could. But before you get too excited, this is the Navy. And of course, seawater as a new power source is only being considered for military purposes. Vice Admiral Philip Cullum said, quote, developing a game-changing technology like this, seawater fuel, really is something that reinvents a lot of the way we can do business. When you think about logistics, readiness. Yes, instead of realizing how seawater could revolutionize all transportation, the Vice Admiral is excited about how seawater fuel will help logistically the Navy. So if you think that this type of technology shouldn't just be explored for the military-industrial complex, then join me. You've come to the right place. Let's break the set.